So this is not Keanu Reeves on the cover, although it looks like it. This is Kevin Mandia, who confessed to me in the tent before that he feels like Keanu Reeves right about at this moment. Um, <laughs> and he still hasn't read the article. He, he's too uh, nervous, nerves, who knows? I don't know about that. To me, when you, uh, maybe this doesn't apply to everyone, but when you're on the cover of a magazine and you're walking through the airport and you see yourself, what I ended up doing is just waiting till the phone calls came in. And if, if I got phone calls that said, this article's horrible and it misrepresents you, then I would have read it for damage control. But I didn't get that. <laughs> So I trust that it's not that bad. So, the truth may not be that bad. Not that bad. So, so uh, if you haven't read it, we encourage you to read it. The background and the backdrop of the Kevin story is uh, cyber espionage by China. And it's increasingly a problem. As we all know, we've all read, the uh, NSA director recently called it the greatest transfer of wealth in history. And of course, what we mean by that is hackers from China uh, going in to computer systems of Fortune 500 companies and stealing trade secrets and using it to build their economy, using it to build their military. In fact, the Pentagon just came out with a report uh, showing that this is a real problem for the uh, defense sector in the U.S. And it's a problem that's been building. And it's typically, though, been handled through quiet diplomacy between our government and their government uh, behind, the door, behind closed doors. Companies don't want to talk about it when they've been, we'll talk about that in a minute, um, when they've been hacked. They don't want to wave the flag and show that they're victims. So it's mostly been talked about in very general terms. So along comes Kevin Mandia. And let me just give you a, a couple key things to know about him. He's a former Air Force Intel officer who's been involved in um, looking at cyber crimes back at the Pentagon, way back when there was, were dial-up modems. Um, he's watched China try to get into the networks, and Russia, and other countries, and, and other hackers going way back. The important thing to understand about Kevin is he's not just a, a computer nerd. He's got this detective sensibility in his DNA. He grew up watching Quincy ME. He uh, got a forensics degree in, at George Washington University. So he really um, likes the whole idea of solving crime. What he decided to do and what put him on the front of the cover of the of Fortune magazine is he uh, developed and released a report that showed very specifically, because the Chinese had, have kept saying, you know, there's no proof that we're hacking into your computers. Well, he uh, issued a report, I'm sure you read about it, front page of the New York Times back in February, that showed very specifically a unit that was tied to the PLA, the Chinese military, had actually hacked into and, and taken trade secrets, memos, et cetera, from uh, at least 147 companies. Uh, he was able to do this, uh, collect this information because his company, Mandia, works for Fortune 500 companies going after cyber threats and cyber attacks. So let me throw it over to Kevin. How did you just walk us through how you found these guys? Well, it wasn't like we're Chinese haters and bashers and we actively hunted just for Chinese hackers. How we found these folks is we just responded to security breaches. We wanted to respond to every computer intrusion that mattered. And as we started doing that, and we started doing that in 2004 as an entity, as we did that, we started seeing commonalities between a lot of the intrusions we saw. And yes, we had intrusions out of Russia, we had some out of Romania, but we saw a growing number out of China. And we started codifying the evidence. So two things led us to finding this PLA Unit 61398 as being actively targeting English-speaking countries, English-speaking enterprises, and stealing their trade secrets. Uh, and one of it was just the technical evidence. As we responded to all these breaches that mattered, we kept having what's called an IP address go back to China. As we traced back these intrusions on the technical evidence side of things, it always went back to Shanghai, Shanghai, Shanghai. At the same time frame, we started an intelligence unit and what these folks are is ex-military folks that they would almost Google the internet every day for evidence using the Chinese character set. And we were looking for information into Chinese hackers. And every once in a while, I called this the anecdotal evidence because the technical evidence led us to Shanghai. And as we tracked the anecdotal evidence, we were seeing resumes being posted at Chinese universities saying, I used to work at this unit 61398, and I hacked for a living. And they were all being placed right in Shanghai as well. But the mothership of evidence really is that we found somehow, some way, 
a document being posted just for a short duration that was an agreement between the Chinese military and uh, Chinese telecom to put in the bandwidth required at a certain building with a certain address and all that just led the technical evidence is that building all these resumes were finding and, and uh, the requirements to work at this unit were right at that building. It, it really, and we had a few other things, but at the end of the day, when you, you looked at all the evidence, there was no other conclusion than that one of the groups that we continue to respond to, and we track about 220 different hacking groups at Mandiant, one of those groups was PLA Unit 61398. No, no other alternative. And they typically, these hackers come in through universities and more unsecured systems before they get to the U U.S. companies? Yeah, I, I, it, there's definitely some kind of beachhead where the attacks come from, and those beachheads are in the United States. So it'll be vulnerable, small to medium-sized businesses that can be compromised, and the attacks get launched from there. But a big, uh, big category of victim computers is academia, whether that be high schools, elementary schools, or colleges. It's just real easy to, in those open academic environments, compromise a machine and then use that compromised machine as your beachhead for other attacks. So you have this information. Um, why did you decide, you really wrestled with the question of whether to release this information publicly. Uh, you're a small company. You'd have, as you said to me, you'd have a gigantic target on your back. You're taking on, you're, you're showing a link between the Chinese government, the military, Right. And, and hackers, because in the past they've denied it. Uh, you're taking on this second biggest economy in the world. Tell us about how you weighed your decision to whether or not to release this right. report. Well, it, there's a bunch of factors, actually. First and foremost, I could feel in the private sector, we've been responding to these breaches for seven straight years. And there became just, the, the status quo was intolerable to the sea level. There are a lot of organizations out there that are spending 20 million, 30 million dollars a year on their cybersecurity programs, but they still weren't keeping the Chinese intruders out. Quite frankly, it's like getting sucker punched on the playground all the time. It just isn't that fair. So you have these large organizations spending all this money, trying to do their best with a technical solution to keep the cyber espionage down to a minimum, and we weren't winning. So that frustration was first and foremost. And then at the same time, we recognized if the technical solution costs so much, maybe it's time to explore some non-technical solutions. I don't know how well it's going to work. I'm not a diplomat. Uh, you know, I don't know if we ask China, hey, please stop whether they're going to do it or not. But I felt maybe it's time to elevate the awareness and elevate the evidence so we could have a real dialogue in a non-technical way and see if we can change some of the culture and some of the interchanges we had. And then the third thing, I was watching the State of the Union address in February where the president said we need to do something about gun control, we need to get more jobs, not necessarily in that order. And then the third thing he got to was cyber espionage, and we have to do something about it. And I think that was kind of the icing on the cake. So we had private sector intolerance. This is just getting frustrating to deal with day in and day out. Can't somebody help? So we wanted to elevate that. Then we also felt there was no technical solution. There's no magic pill you can swallow and the Chinese are just not gonna be able to break in. Right now, if they target your company, there are groups in China that will be successful breaking into your enterprise. I think that's just the state of cybersecurity right now. And then there's a awareness that was growing in the government that it's time we start really thinking about this and doing something. And it became clear through my reporting that um, this, what, this report and your, and, and your staff, you have this elite uh, mm -hmm. unit, that collected this information, they wanted it out as well. But all of this was coming together at a time when the administration was deciding uh, quiet diplomacy isn't really working. We've got to get, we've got to put our boxing gloves on. And, and I think, as you've all seen, um, we've seen a much more aggressive stance from administration officials towards China on this. China put, continues to push back and deny, and, and so far it hasn't gone anywhere. Um, but tell me about the impact on your company. Did you see more attacks on your computer system? Uh, not yet. It's, we were being attacked before, and that also went into the decision to release this report. We knew when we released this report, yes, Chinese hackers were going to try to break in. And one thing that was hard for me to answer is, and I can tell you when we released this report, we didn't know it would get this much acclaim and that this many people would really notice it, quite frankly. You know, when we released the report, I went to work that day and I sat at my desk going, I wonder what's going to happen. And then we did 36 interviews that day. Yeah. So the word did get out there. But um, we were already getting attacked. So that was another thing. I was like, what's the worst they can throw at us when they've been trying to compromise our company 
for the last five or six years anyway. It's, it, it's, we just expect that it would be business as usual. But you, you saw an uptick in spear phishing. Um, you, saw, you said you saw uh, fake car receipts. Right. You saw more kinds of things that you described as kind of creepy. Mm -hmm. Did that make you nervous? Uh, it didn't make me nervous because I've seen all this before, but it is kind of neat. I use a, uh, I use a specific car company to get me to places, and I think somehow I started getting spear phishing as if I was getting a receipt from that car company. So I thought that was a neat targeted attack, uh, but it didn't work. And it's interesting yeah. too, one of your investors was concerned that your company um, could be targeted in a different way, a reputational uh, attack, like going in, releasing embarrassing emails between employees, um, and you know, undermining the credibility of your company. And you know, is that something you're concerned about? And talk about the Chinese, there's different Right. MOs between like the Chinese and the Russians and, and terrorist groups. Talk about right. that. Yeah, there's always an upside to being compromised, and I, I say that facetiously. But at the end of the day, when it's the Chinese, one of the things I've noticed is it's all about collections. Collect intellectual property. Collect, collect, collect information. What I haven't seen is destruction or the lack of availability. So you can still run your operations, nothing gets damaged. And because of that, there's almost rules of engagement. When they compromise our companies, they're not shutting you down. They're just collecting your information and the dialogue and emails between individuals. So that's the upside, is you can still run your business. Uh, there may be, you may have IP that's really hard to replicate, and you may feel secure in the place that uh, maybe the Chinese will never replicate your technology or never really be able to compete just because they stole your intellectual property. Now, and the Russians are a different kind of hacker. I think the Russians are about money. You know, with the Russian organized criminals that we respond to, it's about getting credit card numbers or ATM numbers, you know, track data so that they can withdraw money from ATMs. So it's about getting money for them. And then from Iran or from potential mm -hmm. terrorist-related groups, what do we have to worry about? It's a great question. I could spend the next 13 minutes just on that, but that's, that's the big mystery. You know, we don't have the crystal ball there, but obviously there's people in the world that have different ideology than the United States of America. You can expect, as we rely more and more on cyberspace, I've always said wherever money goes, crime goes, and as we depend on different infrastructure, obviously you can think about uh, targeted attacks that are more destructive than what we've seen in the past. We have responded to uh, intrusions that purport to be from Iran or look that way. Uh, but we have not responded to a destructive one yet. I think that's what everybody's worried about right now is what's worst case scenario? Can someone shut down a grid? Can someone impact the treatment people get at hospitals? And I think uh, we'll see some shots across the bow here shortly. So you've told me that you think that the, our greatest defense is we can find a home address. We, we so. can know where those come from and therefore yeah. there can be retaliation. Is that right? I, I think, you know, when you look at the critical infrastructure, so much of it is in the hands of the private sector. What we need to hope for is if there is some kind of damaging attack to critical infrastructure, that we can pierce the anonymity behind that attack. We have to know who did it and we have to be reliable in, in, in determining that. Because I do believe the deterrent for shutting down Con Ed or shutting down Constellation Energy or any of the utility grids, the deterrent for that's not in cyberspace. The deterrent for that's going to be more physical. So does that keep you up at night? Do you worry about that? I have no trouble sleeping at night. <laughs> so. Um, going back to China, you've described the club of the hacked as a lonely one, companies. Um, right. it's, describe your experience with companies that have been right. intruded upon. Yeah, I always say if you've been hacked and you know it, it's a lonely world. And I think that's changing slowly. But between 2000 and 2010-ish, if you were compromised and you knew it, everything was a liability. You, you just, if you traded with credit cards or you, you were a uh, processor or a retailer and you may have lost credit data, you had the card company sanctioning you, you may have the SEC come to sanction you. If you go public and say, hey, we've had a breach, your shareholders, there may be an impact there. It was a lonely world. And I've sat in a lot of boardrooms discussing this and there's nowhere to turn to to get help. So it was, it was complicated, but right now with more of the awareness, it's almost a brotherhood or, you know, there's a club. If you've been compromised and you know it, there's a little more acceptance of it. And I've responded to a lot of breaches where I do believe that it was academically possible maybe to prevent the breach, but it was absolutely unreasonable to prevent it. And you've seen some big breaches, like RSA's breach and some of these other breaches. I don't think those are very preventable. Those were very crafty very advanced attacks, uh, and we just don't have the infrastructure right now in cybersecurity to withstand those. 
So it's a less lonely planet now when you've been compromised, but the unfortunate reality is it's less lonely because all your peers have already gone through that issue, and you usually can find a, a shoulder to lean on and, and get through the incident together. And you describe, you know, corporate America is largely naked to attacks. I mean, they, you have these firewalls, but you know they 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 breach them and they get in, and you're you have to go in and right. and as the Ghostbusters go in, what happens when you <laughs> go in with your with our capes on and our with your masks. capes? And yeah. <laughs> the the uh, first, it's it's what's changed during my career, and I started responding to incidents in the early 1990s is that it used to be that internet servers, internet facing machines were always compromised. It wasn't a human targeting a human, it was a, a hacker or attacker targeting systems. It's totally changed now, it's a human targeting a human. So if you're gonna be compromised, what generally will happen is somebody researches you personally online as much as possible. They may try to read your Facebook wall, they may try to read every tweet you've ever done, They'll research LinkedIn and see your connections and then send you an email or a Skype message or an IM purporting to be somebody you know or used to know with an with a interesting uh, attachment. And that attachment is usually what drops a payload on your machine. Right now, the number one safeguard most of you rely on at home is your antivirus. It is absolutely, I won't say easy, but any attacker who wants to circumvent antivirus can. So because of the state of cybersecurity right now, it's the end users being targeted, the people sitting at their desktops, and you really can't firewall human nature. So people, you know, it's hard to say, don't click on that link, don't open that email, don't open that Word document. People are gonna do that anyway. Yeah, it's really frightening the kinds of things people click on, you know, a memo from a conference you were just at, or, right. and the rise of social media, it sounds like, is making us all more vulnerable? Perhaps. It certainly gives, gives more. people more research they can do to learn more about you. I, I mean, probably for half of you in this room, I could just research you and figure out what your favorite, well, maybe not in this room, but if you go to a conference and everybody's between the age of 22 and 35, they live on the internet, the internet's like oxygen, you'll learn their favorite movie, you'll know their pet dog's name, you'll know their favorite sports teams, and with half that stuff, you might even be able to get, guess their passwords, but you learn enough about somebody that you can come up with a guise or a ruse to get them to click on a link. And do you see a day where there will be, say, firewall software, something that prevents intrusions? I think no matter what you do, the goal for cybersecurity is always decrease your target area to be as small as possible. And that's always every enterprise's goal. But there's always going to be a little security gap there. And a quick example as to why, and I think iPads are very secure, but iPads are a great example of how technology gets deployed before the safeguards uh, and security is considered. You had widespread propagation of technology before the security that could support it or the asset management that could support it. So you're going to see that. that how, how do iPads, how so? How, do, how so? how does an iPad? Well, when iPads came out, before any security uh, department at any enterprise could do anything about it, there was already thousands on their network. So it just, it just shows technology propagates faster than our, our willingness uh, to secure it or our ability to secure it. So let's go back to the report about China. It was interesting that you decided to, you thought this unit that you um, looked at, you thought they were becoming complacent and this was a good time to, they hadn't changed their operations enough to, right. to but they aren't the only one. I mean, your report said there's 20, possibly as many as 20 units like that um, operating in China. So it's still, it's still a problem. Apparently I should have edited our report back. <laughs> because I didn't know we put that out there. There are more units in uniform that are more advanced than the one that we went public about hacking U.S. enterprises today as we sit here right now. Right. So the reason we, the, the APT1, the PLA Unit 61398, one of the reasons we brought uh, that to the public awareness is other security companies were aware of it. They had numerous nicknames on the internet already. So and talk the, about those, some, some of those nicknames. Well, I think they were called Monk. the comment crew. Yeah. Uh, they had a few others. And it was just time, everybody had already known about it. It wasn't that much of a secret. The government knew about this as well, as far as I can tell. So we just went public with it because it was time to say, it wasn't just someone in China hacking our companies. It was Chinese military hacking our companies. And there's a big difference between just a hacker doing this for fun and somebody who wears a military uniform every day, badges in, goes to work, hacks companies, badges out and goes home. There's a big difference. We're going to have time for like one or two more. Let's right here. And I'm sorry, I didn't, I, yes, the mic's there. Great. Yeah, Rick Chavey with Hybris. Um, question in terms of, first of all, you need to read the story. 
it was a very compelling story. Nina, great Thank job. I, I loved it. Um, but in terms of this conversion from collection of information into actually competitive assets, and I'm sure you've got at least anecdotally stories of companies mm -hmm. you've worked with, and then what have they done since then, <coughs> maybe working with you to again narrow that, <coughs> narrow that scope down? Well, I think that's the next big story, right, is who benefited from all this theft of intellectual property and what are they doing with it all? And I think that'll emerge in time. It will emerge. Back there. Yeah, it's just, um, there, there are anecdotal evidence, like a, a, a drone, apparently, that's being developed in China that, that draws on technology. And, but there, from what I, t when I talk to people, there was a, a sense that there's going to be this lag, this time lag, and we just, we haven't seen it yet. Except for the, what was it, the, there is an Apple store there and a, you know, but, the app, what is it called? The, and, it, yeah. It's He's real, trying to be diplomatic. <laughs> that's me not answering the question, but here's why. When you're, one, you need to have critical mass before you'll see lots of companies come forward at the same time. You don't want to be the lone ranger going out there saying, oh, it's scorched earth right now. Uh, they've replicated our technologies for one-fifth the cost and we're importing into the U.S. You, you want to have a buddy system here. So I think what you're going to see is critical mass in the private sector with real examples, and I think that will all kind of be lobbed over the fence at the same time. Yeah. That's yeah. the safest way to do it yeah. for those companies. Nick Maloney with Herman Miller. Quick question. Do you see any actions from U.S.-based companies or the U.S. government that justifies the behaviors of the foreign countries? I, I don't. Uh, you know, and I may not have a purview to see those things, but I can tell you this. And, and when you said foreign countries, I mean it went to China. Uh, I think the differences are that our government wouldn't hack private sector organizations for economic gain. It just doesn't seem like something, it stretches credulity to think we'd do that. The Chinese are absolutely doing that. They have government entities hacking the private sector, and they're collecting information that the only real conclusion you can draw. When you see terabytes of data, including the CEO's email, every single document uh, around a certain program taken, you have to conclude that the state-owned entities in China are going to benefit from that intellectual property. So that's the difference. Our government may go offensive or hack for security reasons. They are supporting in their country going offensive for economic reasons. And, and maybe there's a gray area between economy and, and security but I don't want to touch You ever that. come across U.S. companies that are doing cyber espionage on Chinese companies, for example? I, I have not. Hello? Yeah. yeah. Hi, Nina. Hi, Kevin. Uh, so Mark Anderson, Invent IP. First, I want to make a short statement and then a question. This guy is a hero. <laughs> and what Kevin did was courageous. <laughs> so it was both smart and courageous, and it was hard to do, I think. And the result of it, I happened to be, as I told Kevin, I, I happened to be with uh, one of the Intel chiefs of the world the morning after. And they were like, whoa. <laughs> it, it changed their world, and it changed our world. And really, it's like before Kevin and after Kevin now. Because having the ability to have attribution changed everything, politically, diplomatically, economically. So thank you. The question is, that great stuff you did on 61398, I suspect could be done on the other X number of groups. And I'm, I'm wondering, is it possible to develop a catalog of behaviors that eventually one can automatically turn to and go, oh, 61399. Right, absolutely. That, that's exactly the intent of a lot of security companies is you don't just want to get a blip on the radar and know, hey, we've got some kind of potential intrusion. You want to know what I call the pucker factor. Is this pucker factor one, it's a drive-by shooting that doesn't matter? or Pucker Factor 5, this is a group, they're sitting in Shanghai, or this is a Russian organized crime sitting in St. Petersburg. No doubt within the next year, or even sooner, you're gonna see a link between, if you get an alert, and maybe even AV or in a, a sim, right click and say, who is that? And, and get information back. It, it's these guys, and here's what they normally do, and here's what you should do about it. That, that's gonna happen. Uh, we'll always miss something, there'll always be something new. Uh, but for the most part, I believe a lot of the most complex cyber espionage we've seen is really the results of maybe 20 to 30 groups. And those groups, we should have a pretty good uh, radar on their TTPs. We have one time for one more question. Way back. Just answer short. Right. Sure. You've talked about the U.S. going from quiet diplomacy to more vocal actions. Uh, in the report, you talk about at least 26 companies in other countries who had similar attacks. Right. Do you see 
those kinds of countries getting more active, getting more vocal in terms of being responsive? Good question. I just haven't tracked it, so I can't answer that question. I do know that there are companies in Japan being compromised and in Europe being compromised by the same folks that are compromising U.S. enterprises. So I believe um, that at some point there will be an outcry, maybe even a United International uh, type of response, but I'm not tracking it as well as I should. Well, Kevin, Hiro, thank you. Thank you.